Hello everyone! Today we're going to talk about the Intellivision Amico. If you clicked on this video, you probably already know what this is. It's this retro console thing made by Tommy Tallarico. He's a famous video game composer, and that's kind of weird for a composer to design a video game console. It's kind of like if Beyonce designed a refrigerator. Anyway, the Amico's main pitch is that they want to get their old games like Shark Shark, Astro Smash, Night Stalker, they want to get those and release them with updated gameplay on this like family-friendly focused environment. The Amico is fascinating to me in more ways than one, and we're going to get into that. Now before we go any further, while I was making this video, a lot of things happened with the Amico. Most notably, Tommy is no longer their CEO. He's been replaced by Phil Adam. Tommy currently has the title of Founder, President, and Chief Creative Officer. And according to a statement he put out, he is, quote, still president and we all make decisions together. It's always been like that. So it seems not much has changed. Tommy is still involved. But I just wanted to point out that executive shuffle happened recently. Also, Intellivision started another crowdfunding campaign on Start Engine. Some people believe the company is going under, but that's a story for another day. It started its life on Fig, which is a crowdfunding site we're very familiar with on this channel. But we're going to head over to Kickstarter because you may not know that this is not the first time somebody has tried to resurrect in television. And hey, would you look at this Kickstarter! This was created back in 2015 and the Intellivision Gen 2 campaign wanted to bring back Intellivision classics like Astro Smash, Shark Shark, and Night Stalker reimagined and modernized for gamers of all ages. Huh, this looks very familiar. Well, I mean, I guess they do say the imitation is the best form of flattery, and then you have- Ah, my! Ah, shoot, I'm sorry. Kennedy! What the hell is Mike Kennedy doing here? To recap for those of you who may not know, Mike Kennedy was the perpetuator of what I think we could safely call one of the greatest hoax video game consoles of all time, the Retro VGS, also known as the Coleco Chameleon. This Intellivision revival was Mike Kennedy's idea in 2015 before the Retro VGS, and of course before that, he had found success with his group Mike Kennedy y Los Bravos. And I would appreciate it if you would help me correct Wikipedia to reflect this. Now before you guys start invading the comments, I know that some of you are getting ready to say, Why are you even bringing this up, dude? This has nothing to do with the Intellivision Amico. That's a completely different project by Tommy Tallarico. This Kickstarter had less than 200 backers. It fell flat on its face. There's no proof that Tommy was even aware of this campaign. Well, yeah, you might think that. Until you go into the comments, and then you see that a Mr. Tommy Tallarico did back this campaign. There's no doubt that Tommy was influenced here. So this new Intellivision revival is a zombified Mike Kennedy idea. And even with the VGS, the similarities are too obvious to miss. It's still this weird gimmicky third-party retro console that goes against the grain. It even has a similar color scheme to the VGS. But this gives us one of the reasons why I think the Amico is fascinating. Because to me, it's like a sociological experiment to see how the VGS would have performed on the market. Because as you remember, the VGS never even secured funding to start any development and be anything more than just plans on paper. With the Amico right now, a lot of people are debating, is this console going to be successful? Is this a viable product? Will people buy it if they saw it on store shelves? It's the same debate we were having back then with the Retro VGS. I see the Amico pitch as a surrogate for the VGS, whether Tommy likes that or not. And so, as one of those talking heads that covered that debacle, this is incredibly interesting to me. But it isn't a perfect test. There are some differences, of course, like the VGS relied on physical cartridges. And another difference is that the Retro VGS had a completely unlikable douchebag as its CEO. Or at least I thought that was the difference, when Tommy Tallarico revealed himself to be a completely unlikable douchebag. This happened in response to a leak published by Ars Technica. Somehow they were able to get access to the Amico developer portal, and they published a lot of stuff that Tommy did not want the public to see. In response, Tommy decided to issue a legal threat. There are many reasons why this is a bad idea. First off, because it doesn't solve your problem. The info is out there, it is being discussed. Your lawyer is not a time machine. You can't make the leak unhappen. The internet owns it now. I've been on the receiving end of legal threats before. And let me tell you, Tommy, there is no better way to embolden your enemy than by issuing a legal threat. I have takedown notices that I wear as a badge of honor. It's the price I pay for covering the truth. A legal threat only adds fuel to the flames, because there are other repercussions that are not so obvious at first. Which is why the word of the day today is optics. I know that Tommy is trying to keep a grassroots image. He wants to show that he's a gamer just like you or me. 
but he is the CEO of a company, so I don't know if he understands the PR consequences to what he does. I don't even know if he has a PR department, maybe it's just him. So let's explain the hidden meaning of fighting these stories like this. First off, it admits that the news report is true. It also admits that the news is embarrassing, and that you don't have a reasonable explanation to give. Because if you did, then you would do that instead of calling your lawyer. It also amplifies the story tenfold. It tells the whole world that there's important stuff to be discussed here. And because of this, there's not even any deterrent value to calling your attorney. I'm sure Ars Technica loved the attention that article got after Tommy's meltdown. If they get more secret information, I'm sure they're going to publish it again. And they hope that article is going to do just as well. And sending the CEO to fight the story makes your company look small. People will ask, why can't you handle this like any other company? And they'll assume, because you're set up in a garage. Rather than fight the story, they could have just ignored it, which is a valid PR move. If that had happened, I think the story would have gone around Atari age for a little while and then disappeared. Because the console was not on a lot of people's radar. Now people know about your console for all the wrong reasons. Also, the leak wasn't even that bad. Everyone knew this would be a low-powered machine. I mean, this was going to be something like an Ouya. And because of that, I've got to say the leak was a little boring. It was very technical about, like, the specs of the device. But to me, those specs show that they do have a concrete plan. This thing will be real. The leak did not show any plans to take the money and run. But of course, the biggest benefit is that your CEO won't look fucking insane. Seriously, what is that? What kind of CEO fights people on Twitter? Not only does it look trashy, but like we said, it makes your company look small because obviously you don't have a PR department or any way to resolve this quietly. But a complete lack of PR is not the only problem with the Amico. There are other problems with their business model that run far deeper. Case in point is their 10 commandments of game design. These are rules that every developer is going to have to follow, but it's really just a list of restrictions. I don't think any of them are conducive to game development. The first one's like every game must be rated E, every game must be playable with little instruction, every game must be balanced for different skill levels. That's all very kid-centric, but it makes the console look like it was designed by Leapfrog. Down at number 7, you start to see the restrictions here. It says every game must be 2D or 2.5D. I guess that's because he wants to focus on it being like a retro console, but this is purely a restriction. There's tons of early 3D retro stuff that was fun. I've got a huge soft spot for those early 3D games. You know those ones that are all jittery and shit? What about Elite on NES? That's a masterpiece. Some of the most amazing games from the past came from developers trying to see how far they could push their hardware with no restrictions. This really made me wonder, has Tommy even played the original Intellivision? Because it had 3D games on it. And my favorite Intellivision game is... B-17 Bomber is a very primitive flight sim. It's janky as hell, but it absolutely takes place in three dimensions. And it's free roaming too, you can travel anywhere on the map. The whole 2D thing is just a rose-tinted vision of what retro was. I don't like that kind of artificial limitation. That's really why this console is not for me. When I think of retro gaming, I think of all the obscure weird stuff that we don't see anymore. Not a walled garden of games that just repeats what's already been done with a new coat of paint. The one thing I agree with is number 9, no in-game purchasing or DLC. Everything else is just a list of why I'm not the market for this thing. So at number 4, they have this requirement that every game must get a 7 out of 10 or more on Intellivision's quality control scale. But have you seen the games that they made for this thing so far? Yeah, I'm sure it's a 7 out of 10 for you, what about the people who buy that shit? And yes, I know, I haven't played it yet. But when you've played games long enough, you can look at gameplay and figure out what's going on. You can't buy everything on the shelf, so you're gonna have to judge a game by its cover. And these games do not look like 7 out of 10 material. How about this, I got an idea. If you're so pro-consumer, then why don't you copy Steam's return policy? They're a digital marketplace as well, and they're probably the most successful out there. As long as I haven't played a game for more than two hours, I can return it if I just don't think it's fun. So why don't you copy that policy? But of course we know why they won't do that. It's because none of these games look like they have more than two hours worth of content. But the problems don't end there. Now I've got to tell you about Doug Tenapple. This guy is great friends with Tommy Tallarico, he's on board the Intellivision hype train. He's the creator of Earthworm Jim. And he's also a fucking walking clan rally. But don't take my word for it. Here's him talking about Nazis. Uh, Hitler was well-meaning, so I don't want to hear <laughs> about your true. intentions. <laughs> That's true. I don't want to hear about your intentions. He was, exter he was just exterminating, uh, quote-unquote, rats. 
which, if you know anything about history, is completely wrong. I mean, Doug, the reason why the death camps were outside of Germany is because they were hiding it from their population. So no, they weren't acting with the best of intentions, they knew what they were doing was awful. And if you want more proof, just look up what the Zonderkommandos were. They were created to erase any evidence of the hol- Wait, wait, wait a second, am I explaining to a grown adult why the Nazis were bad? Yeah, and don't think that that's an isolated incident. He's been accused of being a phobe, so I went to his podcast, and I clicked on the episode that was very helpfully titled, Is Doug Tenapple a phobe? And even more helpful, he admits in the first 14 minutes that, yes, he is a proud phobe. But does that really matter? Because aren't you a Christ phobe? He actually said that. Like, like I'm a homophobe. They feel so justified I'm a homophobe, in their attacking. But is, but is every non-believer a Christophobe? So just right. admit that you fear, you have an irrational fear of Christianity is why. Not that you have a point, but mm -hmm. that you're a Christophobe. Damn, Doug. Checkmate. You got me there, man. You know, I can't pass by a church on a Sunday without protesting. I don't want Christians to get married or raise children. But you know what? I wonder how much of a believer he is because his own Christian fan base is asking him to stop using slurs because that's very unchristian of him. I see they got another episode titled Weed is for files, but I couldn't bring myself to listen to any more because their podcast is so fucking boring. It's one of those Holy Roller podcasts where they pick something from pop culture, like Alien, and then they say, let me tell you how that movie is all about my friend Jesus. Even the director didn't know that. And then we'll play some B-17 Bomber. Many people have been asking Tommy to leave Doug behind. One Amico fan even wrote this long plea on Reddit, which Tommy responded to, and he said that no, he will not drop Doug. So let me ask, why is he keeping Doug? Why is it so important to him? Do you guys see the contradiction there? Why is he so high and mighty about all of his games getting an E rating? So he's drawing a line in the sand when it comes to digital violence, but when it comes to Doug Tenapple, who preaches real world intolerance, that's totally okay with Tommy. For now, let's get away from Doug and his boring podcast, because I promise you, Tommy's appearances are much more entertaining for all the wrong reasons. This one really stood out to me. It's an interview he did with a YouTuber, and it's got all kinds of crazy in it. The YouTuber is definitely a super fan. No, it's good. I mean, that's what I liked about watching you for the last two years. Is I'm honest. Extremely, <laughs> on extremely honest. Sometimes <laughs> probably too much, but yeah. <laughs> Tommy, on the other hand, just starts ranting about cancel culture and anonymous commenters. They, you know, the Twitter culture, if you will, or the cancel culture yep. has, has, you know, um, you know, put people on notice. Anything you say five years from now, you're going to get called out on. You know, I, I think it's an awful thing that where, you know, social media has become, specifically Twitter, too. He says that people who disagree with him aren't normal. You yeah, know, um, but the reality is, is that the average normal, uh, you know, person who finds out about it is positive about it or they just don't say anything, you know. Tommy, you're friends with that freak. Do you think you're some kind of authority on what a normal person is? At one point, the YouTuber has to tell Tommy to stop going into politics. How yeah. dare you like a certain political party when mine's different? Why oh, are you, go there. you know? <laughs> don't go with politics, Jesus. <laughs> and then I noticed that Tommy said this. People love to say, oh, it's the next Ouya. Well, there's so many things that, that you know, one, we're not crowdfunded. Oh, wow. Seems like he's extremely honest. How about a social media platform where everything's just happy and positive. Dude, you wouldn't last a fucking day on that site. And then in the second half of the podcast, they just start talking about the secret. I am not shitting you. You could go check it yourself. A, a daily calendar, daily ch teachings, every day. I was playing a game while I was listening to this, and I stopped and I was like, am I listening to the same episode? I thought it ended and YouTube took me to like some holistic channel or something. If there's an alarm bell going off in your head right now, I hope it's an alarm telling you that this project is being run by people who have no business sense at all. I mean, even putting Tommy's wackiness aside, why on earth would you have Doug Tenapple anywhere near your project? When it comes to artists who have been blacklisted for a good reason, you don't get much worse than Doug Tenapple. Maybe John Kay is worse. Hey, you know what? That's a good idea! Tommy, you guys should hire Doug Tenapple and John Kay to make a game together. I know John Kay isn't a game developer, but neither is Doug Tenapple, so that shouldn't matter. I'm sure that's exactly what your family-friendly game console needs. You guys can call it Christophobes Ate My Neighbors. And have you heard about the new Earthworm Jim TV show? And did you hear that they want nothing to do with Doug Tenapple? You see? How hard was that? They are able to use his IP while keeping him out of the project entirely. And Jim has some views that I'm sure are filling Doug Tenapple with joy right now. 
That's what a normal business does. Because they know someone like that upsets people and turns them off to your product. And I know that Intellivision can just say, Well, Doug isn't part of the actual Intellivision team. Earthworm Jim 4 is a third-party game. Yeah, but remember this photo? I got it from the Amico campaign page on Fig. Sony and Microsoft let third-party developers share their stage with them all the time. But I guarantee you, no matter who the developer was, they would never let Doug get anywhere near the stage. Did I just compare the Amico to Sony and Microsoft? What the fuck is wrong with me? Moving on, there's one more thing that really sets off an alarm in my head. Take another look at Mike Kennedy's Kickstarter page. There's something off about it. It's so unlike Mike Kennedy, it feels like this came from an alternate universe. Do you know what it is? There's no game console involved at all. These games were just going to be digital downloads. Remember, this was months before the Retro VGS campaign went live. That's why it flew under a lot of people's radar, because it was just a side project. Mike Kennedy was still busy hyping the Retro VGS at the time. So why didn't they just move these games onto the Retro VGS? Why didn't we get the Intellivision Chameleon? This is just my own speculation, but I think the credit for that goes to Keith Robinson, the owner of Intellivision who was still alive at the time. When the games are this simple, they don't need their own console. They don't even need a cartridge. Why should the consumer need to buy a separate game console for something like this? It's one of the most persistent questions for the Amico that I haven't heard a good answer for. These games could exist on a tablet. I have more complicated games on my phone. This is a total vanity project, which is sad because the original Intellivision is such a neat little system. It has a very unique selection of games that gets surprisingly complicated. It amazes me that this came out around the time of Atari because it's way more sophisticated. I started playing it while researching for this episode, and I really got into it. I even bought one! It's coming in soon! If you have any interest, you should find one of these collections. They're way cheaper than the Amico, and they still incorporate the controller pretty well. This is what Intellivision should have always been, not this dumbed-down version they're trying to sell us. As for the future of the Amico, some people are saying it might never come out. They are definitely hurting for money, and that's worthy of its own episode later on as more things develop. But right now, I just wanted to point out some of the broader issues I see with their business model, and show you where this demon spawn of an idea came from. It's such a weird device, and I'm sure the story doesn't end here. But that's all I have for today. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.